challenge to talk about uh, or review several things to a group of people that are actually is quite a mix of theoreticians and uh, observers in different areas. So uh, I decided to uh, put kind of highlights of the things that I think are important, that are important, and uh, keep it simple. But uh, this is, of course, not the whole story. So for me, what I wanted really to talk about is the lens setting precession and whether we can detect it or not in uh, neutron stars or black holes. But to do that, I have to talk about I have to talk about QPOs, quasi periodic oscillations, and to do that as well, I need to talk about how we measure spin in these objects, and therefore I have to review a little bit what are AMXPs, accreting millisecond X-ray pulsars. So, although there are lots of subjects, stay with me because it's going to be uh, simple. I hope. So, I'm the first one showing this. The, what I study are low mass X-ray binaries. Basically, you have a star, star like a sun, or a more evolved. You have a compact object, and at a certain moment, mass is transferred to the compact object. It forms a disk, spirals in, it gets very hot, and then if you have, in this case, a neutron star with a magnetic field that is strong enough, then part of the, ma the gas that is flowing in will be channeled uh, by the magnetic field fall onto the magnetic poles. If the axis, the rotation axis and the magnetic axis are not aligned, then you are going to have a pulsar. The interesting thing is, if you see it from the top, is that you will have, of course, the pulsar here. I don't know if you can see the laser. But you will have also the disk rotating very close to the compact object. And it's expected that you will see things that vary periodically at the pulsar, or at least quasi-periodically. And the truth is that we see that, and we are trying to identify, or uh, at least understand what are some of those things that we see. But uh, before, I wanted to mention is that you saw that the suddenly mass was transferred from the uh, companion star to the compact object. And uh, many times people ask me how fast these things happen. And I wanted to give you a few examples for AMXPs. But basically, it's very similar if you uh, check black holes or other neutron stars. And you have basically as much as you want. This is 120 days. These are AMX peaks. And you have some that, well, it's cut, but the rise is very fast. A few days, sometimes. OK, so there it's there. There it's complete. Uh, and then it falls. And sometimes it can fall very slowly, like this one. Sometimes can have like in the lowest panels of the one people are watching there, uh, some weird shape. And if you check the upper panel, you can have this uh, fall and then like a bumps, like a, if it's bouncing. You have everything, basically. And uh, these are time scales of weeks or months. Uh, I think on the extreme of short outbursts, we have a source called NGC 6440X2. This is because it was in the globular cluster uh, 6440, and X2 because it's a second source found there. And what you see in this plot is basically, with arrows, marked all the outbursts that we were able to detect. And basically, we're talking about outbursts that last two days, four days max. They are not very bright, and uh, the source basically disappeared. And we were able to confirm that it was always the same source because we find pulsations. So this tells you that how important it is. And this is extreme. And uh, it was very important result at that moment because basically gave the idea that at least in globular clusters, we might have lots of these uh, systems that are having mini outbursts and we don't know about them. Because actually, the old sky monitors are not sensitive enough to be able to detect them. On the other extreme for uh, a pulsar, is the guy called uh, Hetty J1900, uh, which uh, went into outburst uh, in 2006. This was the last publication, I think, on this, out in, on this outburst. But actually, the source is still active. So it's been many, many years. And uh, why I tell you about these things is because if you check sources that, are not, that have a neutron star and are not pulsars, you have the same phenomenology. You can have very short outbursts, although I don't know of any 
that have recurring orders of two days. But you can have weeks, months, and some of them that are basically persistent, which means that they have been active since we know. Uh, but coming back to, I'm trying to concentrate on the uh, AMXPs, the accretive millisecond uh, X-ray pulses. Of course, the question is why they are important, and particularly for this talk. And I think that the main point is that they allow us to measure the spin frequency of the neutron star, and this is not model dependent. Later on, I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit about black holes, and probably you know that we can measure the spin of black holes, although not everybody agrees that the measurements that we have are robust enough. Yeah? So that is a bit. For neutron stars, you make a you observe it with an X-ray telescope, you make a power spectra of your of your data, you get this spike, and the spike is always at the same place. In this case, 401 hertz. This was the first AMXP, uh, AMXP discovered uh, in 1998. Although uh, they were um, predicted in the 80s. Also, they are very interesting because they allow you to actually measure the orbital parameters of the system, of the binary system, with very high precision. And here I'm showing you actually one not of the best examples, because there are not many points. This is frequency, the frequency of the pulsar. These are the residuals. And basically, you can find fit a sinusoid up and get the orbital period. Uh, the change in frequency is Doppler, Doppler effect. Yeah? If you are lucky and you get uh, AMXP that is, for example, uh, eclipsing, you know the inclination very well. And you have the mass function, function so you are able to constrain the, neutron, uh, the mass of the neutron star. In this case, we still need to know which is the mass of the companion. But if optical observations can get that, then we measure the mass of the neutron star. And of course, as I was saying, you have a friction disk, you have a magnetic field, and that magnetic field has to be strong enough to be able to channel mass, channel gas, onto the magnetic poles, because we are seeing something. And that allows us to actually calculate, more or less, how uh, strong is the magnetic field. In this case, this is the order of uh, 10 to the 8 Gauss. So in general terms, uh, AMXVs are very important because they allow you to do many things. Among them is study binary evolution, uh, the evolution of the magnetic field of the neutron star, accretion disk physics, strong gravity, in some cases potentially uh, calculate the mass of the, of the neutron star, so if you can calculate the radius, then something related with equation of state. And of course, uh, there's a whole thing about the testing the recycling scenario, and I will talk about that in a second. So to continue, I mean, we could talk hours about the sources, about all the phenomenology that uh, is out there and the interpretations and the physics. I wanted to highlight basically two things that I thought uh, they were very important in the last few years. The first one is that um, the AMXPs were predicted in uh, 1982 after the discovery of the first uh, millisecond radio pulsar. But it was not until 1998 that the first one was discovered. Basically, that was because we didn't have a good mission as RXD to be able to do it. Uh, but after starting from 1998 until 2007, basically the discussion was, from the physical point of view, is why do you have source neutron stars that are pulsars, and why you have sources that are not pulsars? And it was or black or white, and all the theories were going around that. Everything changed in 2007 when the first weird guy appeared, the one that I showed a little bit uh, ago, where it showed a very long outburst and it showed pulsations only at the very beginning intermittently. And it was super cool because it was consistent with the theory of uh, having the neutron star, you are putting mass on, onto the uh, surface and basically you are wearing the magnetic field and the timescales were more or less okay. So then everybody was super happy because theory and observations were getting together. Of course, things couldn't be as simple. Uh, in 2008, there was another discovery of another source <coughs> which showed also um, intermittent pulsations on timescales of a few minutes or hours, 
and then it was off for a few hours and then again. And that uh, actually was not that supportive of the blurry scenario, so something else had to come. And uh, these are the four outdoors, there is an, another one here, and uh, basically it looked like there was a relation with the so-called X reverse. There are explosions that happen on the new star surface. And I'll come back to that later. But basically, the thing to uh, remember about this is that we had a second source, which was the intermittent pulsar. The extreme <coughs> was the case of something called a source called Aquila X1. Aquila X1 is a very well-known source. It's been studied for many years, observed with RxD for more than 15 years or basically through the whole mission. And out of 1.5 megaseconds of data, pulsations only were detected for 150 seconds. So for a very, very short time. And actually, it was, as it shows, this uh, upper panel uh, detected at the end of the observation. So by 150 seconds, we would have never detected it. The pulsations are very coherent. There is no doubt that is the spin frequency of the neutron star and it is extremely short, yeah? The other, so this is, I put this as a highlight because it changed the game. Before it was whether it was black or white, the pulsar are not a pulsar and then there is around it. Now, all the, the models have to take into account that you could have a source that could pulsate every now and then, one every, once every 15 years, or in every outburst with a 10% uh, Right. The second highlight that I wanted to put is actually a discovery of a few months ago. It's a source in, uh, I think it's an N28. It's called IGR blah, blah, blah. And it's a missing link. Basically, uh, after the discovery of the first millisecond radio pulsar, people thought that if you had a, pulse, a slow radio pulsar, of, with a magnetic field of uh, 10 to 12 Gauss, uh, that pulsar would turn off, and it could be spin up, spin up, if you are in a, in a binary system where you are transferring momentum through the disk. Um, the prediction is then not only that you would see very fast uh, AMXP, so pulsars in the system, but also that you would see uh, the transition between X-ray pulsars and radio pulsars. And that was not seen actually until a couple of the, uh, months ago. So this is, if you're interested in this, check it out. Lots of, I know that lots of papers are coming about that. Very shortly, I was talking about X-ray bursts. Basically, you put matter on the neutron star surface. Yeah, It accumulates, it's fuel, it's hydrogen, a little bit of helium. And at a certain moment, the pressure and densities are going to be uh, the correct ones, so you have unstable burning. And that produces an explosion on the neutron star surface that burns the whole surface. It happens very often. This is a light curve of one source. And uh, those spikes that you see there is, are these explosions. So to give you an idea, in, this, uh, in each of these explosions, you can have the same uh, emitted energy than the sun in a week or 10 days or something like that. This is zoomed into one of them. And why I'm talking about this is because if you see the picture that we have of how an explosion starts, you start with a hot spot that actually will cover within a fraction of a second the whole neutron star surface. But if you have a hot spot, you have for a fraction of a second a pulsar. So it's another way to actually measure the spin of the neutron star. And these kind of things have been seen many times the, the red on that uh, figure is basically the frequency of the, of the pulsar. I'm not going to discuss the phenomenology there, but I can tell you that the asymptotic frequency that you see there, we see it again and again and again in 20, 50, 100 bursts of, again of one source. So we don't know the uh, spin of the neutron star to a precision like in a pulsar, but within a hertz, it's fine. And for the things that I want to talk about in a minute, that is more than enough. So as a summary, what is important for what is coming is how many pulsars we know. And how many, sorry, how many neutron stars where we know the spin 
we know. And this is more or less the histogram. So spin frequencies between about 100 hertz to uh, 650 hertz, I think it is the maximum. And uh, it's about 15 AMXPs, and the rest are ber from burst oscillation, from explosions. So stay with me. Now I will change a little bit the subject to what is called the quasi-periodic oscillations. So far, no one mentioned it. But basically, it's an oscillation that either the amplitude of the period or something is changing. Maybe it's disappearing. The lapse time is very short. And uh, what I'm talking about is in the context of whether the accretion flow very close to the Newton star is actually affected by the magnetic field. You, you go out there, well, no, you send an email, you get an observation from your favorite source, you do a power spectrum, and uh, you compare sources, and you see that they are very similar. This is actually a pulsar. This is not a pulsar. The shape is very similar. And this is actually what we call broadband noise. There are some peaks there. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but let me show you another one that is nicer, where you see peaks, very clear peaks. If you are in this area, you start studying power spectra of neutron stars and black holes, and then you immediately notice that the shapes look very, very similar. So what people have done is say, OK, let's take some of these uh, frequencies as a reference and plot, it, plot them against each other. So plotting frequencies versus frequencies. And what people found is that there are correlations between those frequencies. So the appearance is not just right. There are many, many correlations published, but I think the two that made it like the, to the top is one that is called the PBK, or the BPK, depending on the first or second paper. If you have anything to complain, one of the authors is there, Benoni. And uh, the interesting one, the interesting thing about the, this correlation, and the next one I'm going to show, is that it involves neutron stars, but also black holes. So the power spectra of neutron stars and black holes are very similar. And actually, you can put also neutron stars that are pulsars. Another relation that is quite tight is this one. This is called the WK relation as per Binance and from the field. And again, the, in different colors are different type of sources. So why I'm showing you this is because if you assume that these correlations that I show you are real, in the sense that it's not just by chance, that means that the QPOs, the frequencies of that we measure are produced by the same phenomena, either in a black hole or a neutron star, whether the neutron star is bright or not that bright, or if it's a pulsar or not a pulsar. So there is something uh, essentially there that can tell us about the compact object. So I'm going to the third part, and then I will connect everything. The third part is lens theory, precession. And uh, well, as you know, probably most of you can explain me this more, much better than I know it. But in Newton's gravity theory, mass is the source of gravity. But when you are in uh, Einstein's theory, then it's basically any energy momentum, including the angular momentum, is the source of gravity. What does mean, what this means for what I want to talk about, is that if you have a, an accretion disk, you have a compact object, yes? And the spin, of the, the spin axis of this compact object is not aligned with your disk, you expect that this, the disk is going to start processing, yes? And assuming that the spin is not zero. And what you get is some animation like this one. Uh, if you want to know the details of this, wait until Thursday that Adam Ingram is going to give a great talk about it. But basically, what you have here is a, a black hole. There is a 10 degrees misalignment between the disk and the spin axis. And what you are interested in is in the black part inside, which is processing. And this is basically lens in precession. I wanted to, to put a formula, it has to be part of the, like the other talks, only one. This is the simplified case that you have a test particle going, a test particle um, going very close to the compact object. And you see that the frequency of this precession, the one that you expect, 
is proportional to the uh, moment of inertia, the mass of the compact object. This is the um, nu phi is the Keplerian frequency in the disk, and the spin frequency of the of the neutron star. So, if you have this, uh, then ideally, if you measure the, the a frequency that you know that is the the uh, length setting per session, you know the spin frequency of the neutron star. You can measure this one, then you have an idea of the mass of the moment or the moment of inertia. Of course, this didn't work. If this was proposed already in 1998, data were not supported enough for this model. And it was not until a, a few years ago where there was a, a series of papers by Ingram et al. where they showed that if you actually forget about a test particle, but now you are talking about flow, and you are <coughs> taking more things into consideration, Actually, you are able to describe some of the power spectra that we see. So we have these peaks. And I'm here, I'm cheating because it's a black hole, but it should work for neutron stars. The point is, for neutron stars, we know the frequency, really precise. For black holes, we don't know. There is a lot of discussion. Uh, the problem with the neutron stars is that the range in frequency was not wide enough. It was between 100 and 600 hertz. So if you, if you do calculations and you plot, you get discrepancies, but they are not healing. Everything changed a couple of years ago when there was an outburst of a source in Thurston 5, the global factor Thurston 5, that showed pulsations at 11 hertz. That is a difference of you know, a factor of 20 with all the other pulses. And that suddenly you can test length theory precession uh, on this source. Extra, because it shows power spectra that are exactly the same as what we have seen so far. Uh, I don't know if it's very visible, but this one is the new source, Thurston 5. This is another one well known. It's called GX 17 plus 2. And this is another one, 1728. And if you compare those things, you actually can find that the, the, the power spectra really look the same. We, of course, have to test the correlations that I was showing you before. This is the WK correlation. And uh, in black is certain type of black holes. I don't want to go to details. Red other ones. Blue are black holes. And the new source are in green. And it falls in the correlation. So it looks like the frequencies that we are measuring are the correct ones. For the experts, we also tested other correlations. And we, were, we wanted to be sure what we were measuring. And really, everything looked like that we were seeing a normal source, except that this time we knew the frequency and see the recurrence. So if you plot all the frequencies versus the radius in Schwarzschild ready of where they should be created, I'm talking about uh, the Keplerian frequency, the normal frequency, peri peri oh, well, and the other frequency. And you compare it with the frequencies that we measure. The highest frequency that we measure is here. It's called kilohertz QPOs. It's really high. The QPOs at lower frequency were about uh, between 30 and 40 hertz. They were here. But for an 11 hertz pulsar, making the worst assumptions that you can make, like, for example, imagine that you, don't, you have a shell as a neutron star. You don't have a, a homogeneous uh, neutron star, but you have a shell. So we were wanted to maximize the frequency that you expect as a length of precession. Then you get the pink area. And the QPOs or the frequencies that we measure are, are up here. So it, it was bad. I, didn't like, I would have preferred to say, hey, I identify the length term precession. I prove it. But actually, for this particular source, what I prove is that it didn't work. And uh, there was no way around it. We tried to find the mistake somewhere, and we couldn't. So for sure, for one source, for one neutron star, we cannot, uh, length term precession cannot be there. We could not detect it at those frequencies. And that's bad. What is also bad is that if we didn't know about the, the spin frequency of the new, this neutron star, we would have said, 
is the same as the rest ones because it really looks the same as many others. So if there's doubt or whether the other QPOs that we see in other neutron stars and by extension in black holes are produced by lens set in precession. And it's all basically based in this type of correlations that we have. So to conclude, I gave you bad news. For some people think that these are bad news. But not everything is bad. There are good news. And, uh, but I'm not allowed to talk about them. You will have to wait until tomorrow that Thomas Willan is going to talk about black holes, where they think that they have uh, identified the QPOs that actually show you lens in precession. And I invite you to also talk, see the talk of uh, Adam Ingram on his model, which is very, very cool. And I will finish here. Thanks.